Today's message is about why my prayers don't get answered. You know, that's uh, one of the hardest questions a pastor can ever be asked. Why do I not receive answers to my prayers? Looks like we have our flood back. <laughs> you know, that's something we've been praying about for a long time. It's fixing our roof. Well, there's a gentleman that's supposed to come in the work crew that we have started to patch our roof. You know, and it's something we've been praying for a long time. And, you know, so the first thing God did is he let us put a, you know, a coating over it. And that did fix it for about four years. You know, and as just over time, the roof, because it's age, is starting to leak again. And so we're praying, you know, and at that time, we didn't praying for a new roof. We were praying to fix the roof. So that's what God did. He fixed the roof. So now when we pray, we are asking for a new roof. <laughs> and if we should have asked for the first time. <laughs> so, so the whole point is prayer is very, very personal. It's probably the most personal part of worship. Worship being showing our love to God. That's what worship is. We come to church and we sing. We, we study our Bible. We, we pray. We get down on our hands and knees and we talk to God. And you know, that's all part of worship. And our whole life is worship. The more we worship, the closer to God we become. The more we worship, the more we pray, the more we study the more we understand the will of God and how loving he truly is. That he is a wonderful, loving God. He's not this mean ogre just, just waiting to strike you down like Zeus with a lightning bolt. Even though, as we've been going through a lot of messages, that is essentially what Western Christianity teaches. You're separated from God and he really doesn't love you. And so religion means rebind, have to rebind yourself to God. So we get caught up in this doing good deed thing Go back to God in our prayer and say, see, 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 I'm worthy of your love now. Even in one of the songs, they mentioned that. Please love me again. It's interesting how my view of the things I see and read uh, from other Christians changes. You pick up on these belief structures. And it's, it's odd that, that it has happened so fast. Normally, you know, when God makes changes in our lives, like when GC, WCG changed, we we're all involved in that. It took a long time for that to happen. Because, you know, a lot of this stuff is hardwired into us. You know how an electrician will come in, they got a big wire, and they got another big wire, and they wrap everything together, then they solder it, and then they cover it. And that makes an incredible strong bond that no human can pull apart. And we get these things in us, and we get stuck with that. And then one day we realize, you know, this really isn't right. And we go to God and we say, Dad, I need you to fix this. I can't live with this and I can't break this bond. And what happens? That process begins where God comes down. He says, okay, you really want this, don't you? Yes. But he's not going to just go, done. He's not. You don't grow when that happens. You don't become more like him when that happens. So what does he do? Well, he gets out his knife and he starts carving off that special covering that was put on there to protect that weld. And that's painful. And then he takes fire and he starts heating that weld. And one by one, the wires pop loose. And he's pulling on them and they're popping loose and they're popping loose and they're popping loose. And eventually he rips it apart. And there's God holding these two ends and you're looking at him, whoa. I'm feeling really good about this. I don't really feel that way anymore. Now, I gotta replace it with something. So he grabs that and he goes over to the proper one that it should have been cooked to in the first place. And again, he starts welding them all together. One by one, bit by bit, little by little. And there's still, it's trials. But these are better trials. These are good trials. These are things that make us feel happy and contented as we go. And then as he goes, he gets them all together. He gives them a couple tugs and then he puts that coating on it again. And then you have a new bottom line from which your whole life is understood. And what I found interesting is when I heard 
Mr. Kruger's sermon. And I was listening to that and what he said. It hit such a strong chord that I realized that's why so many of us don't have God's love. It's because we don't believe we have God's love. And when I realized that, yeah, I do. Always have. Always will. It was almost like he just took a pair of snips and snapped it and went over here and put it together. It was, but it wasn't. God has been working on that for years through a lot of really tough trials. And then he put it together. And that's working for all of us. And I can see it in everybody in this room. I can see it in Tacoma as well. There's an attitude change. There's a more reaching out change. But, you know, today I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak. Everybody in this room has been through times in their lives when they said to God, why aren't you answering my prayers? So today's sermon's a little bit different than yesterday's sermon in that when somebody asks you that question, what do you say to them? The first thing you need to say is, I cannot tell you why your prayers are not being answered. But I can give you why God says your prayers might not be answered. And in scripture, there's several scriptures that deal specifically with answered prayers. One of them says, if you believe, you will have answered prayers. Another one says, if you worship in spirit and truth, if you pray in spirit and truth, and we'll go through that. And the last one is because you ask a myth, which is probably the most famous scripture that people will say, well, that's because you're asking for the wrong stuff or the wrong reason. And that could be true, especially with young Christians. Because what are they taught in this country and somebody, if I'm an average preacher out there and I'm trying to get young so-and-so to accept Christ, what do I do? I think to myself, okay, what does this guy want? And you think about it, you know, what does he want? Well, he's young. Oh, he's going to want a car. And he's going to want this. And he's going to want that. And you tell him, you know, if you accept Jesus and you do live the lifestyle he wants, he'll give you all this stuff. Okay, that starts a seed. That starts a baseline, which is wrong. We call it the prosperity doctrine. And so you have just doomed this kid to years and years and years of trying to get back to God, of doing good deeds for all this material stuff. The truth of the matter is, if you will seek God's kingdom, if you will seek his love, if you will seek changing your heart, mind, and soul to his heart, mind, and soul, he will give you this stuff later. But scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all this will be added unto you. You know, and somebody that God is truly calling will respond to that. Because truly, what do they want? They want emotional stability. They want to feel good. They want to be happy. They want to have joy. They want to have peace. How do you have all that? You seek the kingdom of God. You learn what God wants. You learn the lifestyle God asks us to live. You know, there's been prayers in this country and around the world for years that we need a Christian president. I mean, a real Christian president. And isn't it interesting that God could not find a single politician that is a real Christian? Not one. He had to find a delexic, ADAD genius who's 70 years old, made about every mistake a man can make. He's not a moral giant, but he's an honest man, and he believes in God. And we are in a titanic battle for this country right now. And it's President Trump against everybody else, pretty much. And there are a few politicians that are still Christian, but they've been beaten down for so long and they've been told for so long that they're wrong. That the liberal way is the right way. That they've given up. 
So our prayers have been answered. Millions of Christians all over this country have been asking God for that for years. God, please give us someone that will make it so we can continue to preach the gospel. And God knew that what Rick was talking about up there, the war on, on it's not a war on religion. It's a war on Jesus. That's the only one they're after. They're not after Muhammad. They're not after Buddha. They're not after any of the others. They're only after Christ. Why? Because it's Satan against God. You know, and our prayers have to be based on the spiritual side. That's the ones God will answer. The physical side, he will just give it to you. You don't even have to ask. He wants you to have it, and he will give it to you when the time is right for you. It's like when you got your car. It was the time was right for that car. And God gets a kick every time you hop in it and take off singing and dancing. He loves it. He goes, look, son, I gave her that car, and she loves it. This is just, it's the same thing with all material things. You know, Jesus, when he went to the triumphal entry, there's a little story about a fig tree. And Jesus was walking along with his disciples. He sees a fig tree, and he was hungry, so he walks over to the fig tree, and he sees there's no figs, and he looks at the fig tree and says, you will never feed anybody again. And depending on which uh, um, book you read it in, either it just died right in front of their faces, or the next day when they came by, it was dead. Does it matter which one it was? Not really. Everybody sees things differently. That's why when a policeman has a problem, they want as many witnesses as possible. It's like a giant puzzle. They get everybody's view, put it all together, and that's pretty close to what happened. So that's kind of the same thing with scripture. Different writers see things in a different way. It's not that they're wrong. It's just a different view of things. So anyways, on the way back, the disciples look at Jesus and they go, look, the bush, it died. And they were surprised. You know, and here's Jesus, and, and why he said that is it was springtime, so there really wouldn't be no figs on it. Anyways, no fig tree had them. So why did he kill the fig tree? I believe he did it to prove a point, a big, big exclamation point. He was teaching his disciples something, and what he said to them was, let's see, did I write that down here? If you believe... You will receive whatever you ask for, ask for in prayer. You know, there's lots of different kinds of prayers. There's thank you prayers. There's how you doing prayers. There's I'm having a good time, dad prayers. You know, things are kind of bad, dad. I'm kind of miserable, you know, kind of prayers. And then there's prayers of request, which is what we're talking about. You ask God for something. You know, Jesus asked God for a lot of things. And if you read his request prayers, he always, prefaced, he always ended it with a statement. Not my will, but your will be done. See, on his human side, we don't always know that if what we ask for is his will. We don't. We know that it's something that we think we need, or we think somebody else needs, or that they might want, or what we might want. But really, only God knows for sure if it's good for us. So when you say that, you're telling God, this is my request, Dad. And it won't kill me if you say no. It won't kill me if you say later. But it'll make me jump for joy if you say yes right now. It's an attitude. So Jesus killed the fig tree, and they were amazed. That fig tree died because Jesus believed it would die. Whenever you ask something to bring somebody to Christ, that is almost always an immediate yes. Did you notice most of his miracles were always a yes? And almost all of his miracles were bringing messages, making ways for people to come, well, to himself, 
to God? Those kind of prayers will almost always be a yes. Remember the lady at the well? Jesus told her all about her husband and everything, and she was all amazed. And, and the interesting thing is, she was obviously Jewish at heart. Because she, she, she started talking to Jesus, and she says, you know, you Jews, because she knew he was a Jew, and she was amazed that a rabbi would talk to her, so she had questions. So she took the opportunity to say, you know, you Jews say you have to worship in Jerusalem. We say you have to work him out with a gazebo or something like that. And Jesus just kind of looked at her, and his answer was amazing. He says, well, you know, the Jews know a whole lot about God. You don't know hardly anything about God. But the day is coming, and now is, when you will worship God in spirit and truth. In other words, you'll worship God wherever you are. And of course, she jumped up and ran off to get all of her friends. And then the disciples came in, and he explained to them that, uh, uh, what he was talking about. But you know that word, spirit, if you look that word up in the concordance, that's a really interesting word. You know, it has a lot of meanings. It can mean breeze, like a wind. It can mean a blast of wind, like a 100-mile-an-hour you know, wind. It can mean rational human soul. It can mean mental disposition, divine God, Christ Spirit, or Holy Spirit. And I found that interesting. The one that interested me was the human rational soul. Have you ever noticed how a lot of times when we pray, we're emotionally distraught? We're just really torn up about something and we ask for all kinds of weird stuff? Yeah, you've just lost your husband. And you're absolutely miserable inside and you don't know what's going to happen with your whole life. And you're talking to God, you know, asking for another husband, asking for this to be fixed. All kinds of weird stuff, which have nothing to do with your spiritual growth or your spiritual life. Because our human heart is emotion. And it can run amok real fast. Matter of fact, if you notice, almost always it's through our human emotions that Satan gets to us. He does. That's how he gets to us. So prayer needs to be done through our rational soul. Rational soul will say, well, what's the real situation here? What is really going on here? If you've lost a loved one and it's the husband you've lost, it's how am I going to financially survive? How am I going to take care of my kids? How am I going to keep this house? How am I going to, how am I going to, how am I going to? That's the reality of your situation. That's what is really tearing at you. And you're angry at God or your husband or whatever for allowing him to die. Or if you're the husband, you're angry at God for, okay, how am I going to do all these things? How am I going to take care of my kids? How am I going to do all the stuff my wife used to do? And our emotions go nuts. We get mad. We get upset. Rather than going to God with a rational soul, the rational part of your thinking, and say, Dad, here's my situation. This is what I think I need. Yeah. Yeah, your rational, yeah, that would be a, a definition of spirit. It says, um, worship the Father in spirit and truth. So, worship, so in that one definition, you worship. In a rational, a rational mind, not an angry, upset, emotional mind. Because when you look at God, he's emotional, but he's also incredibly rational. He thinks everything out. He knows exactly what the situation and what exactly needs to be done. And that's the spirit side of us. You know, there are times when God would act emotionally. He would say, I'm upset, I'm jealous, and those kind of things. But it was irrational. He had a good reason to be angry, jealous, and upset. Okay, did you get the difference? Rather than if God just went wild and destroyed the whole world. Oh, I shouldn't have done that, so he just created all back. You know, that, that's not God. 
When he flooded the world, there was a good reason for that. And he planned it a long time ahead, you know, 100 years to build that ark. It wasn't a whim. Real good reasons. And our prayers need to be the same. And truth. The word truth. Means true, truly, or verity. I found that really interesting. That word was in there. You know, verity means conformity to the truth, conformity to the facts, or conformity to reality. Isn't that interesting? That those two words are side by side. Again, God is telling us, look, you need to think about what you're praying for. Consider your situation. Maybe your prayer needs to be, what is my situation? I don't know. I'm really upset. I've lost my loved one. Things are really bad for me right now. But what's the reality? So he sent someone to talk to you, and you're like, oh, I guess that's really not quite bad. What it is, I've lost my loved one, and that love is gone. I don't have that anymore. I understand that God can take care of all the other stuff. We had insurance. We have this. We have that. So really, all those are taken care of. It's in, this, in, uh, in most of our cases, it's the lost dreams. It's the love of our life is gone. You know, all this, that kind of thing in those situations. So we go to God and say, I've lost the love of my life. I know that I'll mourn and be miserable for however long. But please, down the road, help me find someone else to love. That puts your mind in a godly situation where you can be calm, where you can rest assured in the love of God that he's going to do it. For most people, from time to time, though, somebody who loses their husband or their wife, he has something else for them to do. And so we need to be open to that as well. That's part of the rational thinking. Well, God, you know, I am no longer tied up with a wife and children. My children are grown and gone. My wife has passed or my husband has passed. Is there something else you want me to do? There might be. And he will show that to you. But prayer really needs to be done with a great deal of thought. when you're requesting things, especially. The human rational soul, your mental disposition, what's your mental disposition when you're praying? It needs to be rational. Now, there are times when you can go to God and say, I'm so upset that I don't know nothing. I'm just going to unload. I'm going to crawl up in your lap. I'm going to cry, and I'm going to unload, and I'm going to say a whole bunch of stuff, and then at the end, you're going to comfort me, pat me on my little butt, and send me on my way. That's a rational prayer. You realize that your emotions have got you so tied up that if you don't vent, you're going to explode. And so you go to God and you vent. And I suspect he really loves it when we do that. Because you can't do that if you don't love him. If you don't know that he loves you and that no matter what you say, he's not going to take it personally. You can sit there and blame him for everything. And he knows. He knows that you're just venting. But again, that's a, you've thought it out and you've realized that, you know what? I have to do this. I have to vent to somebody. And why not to the one that can actually do something about it? And the last one, is found in James 4, 1 through 17. Anyways, James is talking about all the different things in the world that get us into trouble and whatnot. And he comes down at, in verse 3, he says, and he's talking about prayers and what you're asking for and the different things we ask for as human beings. And most of them, in this case, he's talking about is gimmies. You know, I want a new house. I want a new car. I want this. I want to be this big hot dog over here so that I can satiate my lust for power and all that kind of thing. You know, things that are not for Christian, not of God. They are things of ourselves, stuff that we want so that we can feel good about ourselves in this physical, spiritual way. 
And he says here, and even when you do ask, you don't ask, you don't get it because your whole motive is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. See? And that comes back to the prosperity doctrine. What a lot of pastors will use to get the young to commit to Christ. At that age, for the most part, they're just, they're, they're planning their future. Their hearts are running amok. So many of them, and men especially, their frontal lobe hasn't even developed completely yet. So they can't see into the future. And to go to those people and pray on this, I mean, that's really, really a bad thing to do. Because then they end up like so many when they get in their 30s and 40s, wondering, what in the world am I doing? And if there's, God doesn't provide somebody there to help them figure it out, their life is a mess. So we need to determine with our rational mind, what am I asking for? Am I asking for this for me to fulfill one of my lusts? Or am I asking this for others? Is this a thing of love? You know how Mr. Armstrong used to do it? The way of give and the way of get. Is this a give or is this a get? You know, there are times when a husband will ask for a new car, not because he needs a new car, but he knows his wife does. He doesn't want to run around in an old piece of junk that breaks down every five minutes. So he'll pray for a new car. That's a righteous prayer. And God will probably answer that. You know, when you go to God with that kind of prayer, it's, Father, we need a new car. I need you to provide me a way to earn the new car. And I'm going to start looking. And please lead me to it. Provide us with a new car. And I can't tell you how many times people have talked to me about that prayer. And he doesn't make them buy it. Somebody just hands them a car that runs great. And if they accept it and say, thank you, you know that was a righteous prayer. If they say, no, God's going to give me a new car. I don't want that old car. Well, you're <laughs> wondering. So when we hear people ask us or mention things as, why don't my prayers get answered? Chances are it comes down to their reason for asking for things or the reason for their prayers. Yeah, go ahead. That's, that's, sometimes that could be the case, or it could be the answer is no. You know, because God gives one of three answers, yes, no, or maybe, or later. And it might be, even though we're asking God to take care of these people, it might be that they need to go through it. Yeah, go ahead. You know, and think of all the growth Rick got through those years that he wouldn't have got if God had just healed him right away. You know, Rick is a very different man because of that than what he would, probably would have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, when you're answering that question, why God's not answering your prayers, maybe he said no. Maybe he's saying later. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's when you get into, we're, we're pretty much mature Christians here. We have overcome a lot of those problems. Jesus has blessed us mightily. We understand that there's yes, no, and maybe. We understand that we don't always know what's right. But some, most Christians out there, they don't have our background. They don't. They think that because they've done good deeds, they should get what they want right now. They don't understand that you, God answers prayers that fit his will. And so once you learn his will, then you understand how to petition him. You begin to understand that the material things aren't that important. Any old car will do, as long as it gets me from A to B. If it's gorgeous, fine. That's wonderful. If it's not, that's fine too. It is. What's important to God is our spiritual inside. And that's what I tell people when they ask me, why aren't my prayers being answered? I take them through these scriptures. And I try to get them to understand that God is looking for the spiritual. You want a new husband. Okay, you petition God. You know what? Satan also knows you want a new husband. And you have to be very careful that Satan doesn't bring you the wrong husband. Or the wrong wife. Because he'll do it. It's just like a teenage boy. A teenage boy who's a predator. He finds a girl he likes. He finds out what emotional needs she has. He fulfills those. He has sex with her, and then he's off to the next one. Satan is the same way. He watches. So we have to be very, very careful in our prayers that they always end with, not my will, but your will. I guess that really comes down to why prayers don't get answered. Are you praying within God's will, or are you praying within your will? If it's your will, not likely. If it's in his will, it's either yes, no, or maybe. If it's in your will, it's going to all probably. But you know, I will say one thing. God does say that if you keep petitioning him, you might change his mind. Some people are persistent. And they will pray for a wrong thing, and pray for a wrong thing, and pray for a wrong thing, and pray for it. And then God, one of the, every now and again, he'll go, you know what? I'm going to teach my child a lesson. I'm going to give it to him. Of course, he won't. Satan will. And then they get it, and they think it's all from God. They marry this guy. Six months later, they're in divorce court. Because the guy hid from him that he's an abuser, or whatever. Now, the rational mind would say, here's a wonderful man I think is wonderful. But I have to check him out. I have to date him long enough for his true colors to shine. Not, oh, well, he's from God, let's get married. That's a dangerous thing to do. So just remember, prayers and God, <laughs> just because you don't think they're being answered, they might be. No might, they are answered. It's either yes, no, or later. Can you take no? Or can you wait for later? <laughs> well, that's why you have to keep your mind, you gotta try to keep yourself in that rational part of your mind, <clears throat> which is the, the human spirit more so than uh, the, what is it God calls us our um, nature, our evil nature, our wicked nature, our wicked heart. You know, the, go ahead, Dave. Uh, the reason I was really uh, almost laughing is because that's exactly what you you mentioned uh, that Barry said to me. <laughs> she said, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact words right now, but she was going to check me out first before she did anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's a mind that is rational. Yeah. That's the rational part of her mind controlling that emotional part. 
and, and that's, you know, you can see it in God. His rational part of his mind controls his emotional part. Both are perfect, but it's an example for us. Jesus was, you know, another thing you can have people do if they're wondering why their prayers aren't answered is to have them go through and read every prayer that Jesus made. And then when they're done, you start going to them, are your prayers matching those prayers? Or are your prayers different? Yeah, well, he didn't have to then, you know. You know, so anyways, you know, for a pastor and for anybody, that is really a hard question to answer. Why are my prayers not answered? Because everybody's life is so different. Everybody's experiences are so different. You know, to, to ask to, for me to tell somebody why their prayers aren't being answered, I can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why God doesn't answer those prayers, I don't know. But, you know, maybe for children, they probably don't feel like they can get away. You know, they're, especially small children, they, they know nothing else. But adults... We can work away. Right. Well, it's not. But it's also free moral agency is involved in a lot of this as well. You know. And so, but if a child, you know, if a child comes up and says, I'm being beaten, well, there you go. He has just asked for help, and then you go to the authorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is trying to fill in a need. Everything is interrelated and caused by this happened, that happened. Sometimes it's a genetic thing. Sometimes that's not very often, but sometimes it is. And, but anyways, when you're a Christian and you claim to understand and worship God and to love God, it's going to be these kind of things, what we're dealing with. That's what this, me this message isn't about, that poor little kid that's getting... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, it's a huge subject. And it's just, it's, it's really a subject that's bigger than any of us. Only God knows the answer. And I can just tell him, here's some things to look at. Here's some things to consider. Now go to God with it. And he will teach you why your prayers aren't being answered. And usually you're going to come to an understanding that it's yes, no, or maybe. At the end of the sermon yesterday, as I was walking out, one of the ladies stopped me and says, well, basically it comes down to yes, no, or maybe, right? Well, yeah, these are mature Christians. They understand that. But young Christians may not. They were taught that I did all this good stuff, therefore I get. And really, the Holy Spirit has to convict them of that. We really can't. We can say it and say it and say it, but until the Holy Spirit breaks that wire and connects it to the right place, there's not much you can do. Quick prayer. Most Holy Father, our God, our King, we thank you so much for all the blessings you've given us, that you help us to keep the important things of life in mind, prayer, Bible study, fasting, doing all the good deeds that you want us to do, and being in love with you worshiping you always that keeps us out of trouble so father even though we don't know why somebody's prayers might not be answered you do and so we ask that you help us to give them the right questions to ask or the right places to look so that they may come to you with an open heart and an open mind 
and that you can teach them and that you can drive them up into your lap and hug them and hold them and pat their back and teach them your way of life and that they will realize that you hear their prayers and that they are answered. And we ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.